Can you hear this? Yeah. So I think this is the last panel of the day, and afterwards there's going to be a wonderful conversation. So we are going to try to pull in all the strands, or at least a lot of them that we've heard, and see whether we can come up with you know, some of the solutions, some of the can-do, and some of the political issues as well that surrounds all of this uh, technology design. And particularly since we heard again at the very beginning of the, uh, of the, of the uh, presentation that something like 1.3 .3 billion, or oh, sorry, one in three people will be in informal settlements, uh, i.e. slums and uh, other such poverty-stricken areas by the year 2050. Can I just at the start say to the technicians up there, Three of my uh, panelists have some slides, and I would like to bring them up now just to make sure that the technology works and you guys can basically figure out what it is. Uh, Jeanette uh, Sadiq Khan, you have some slides about uh, pedestrianization and biking. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Jonathan Ledger, have some slides about the drone ports, so what it looks like and how you're going to build it, and that's to really address the poverty issue and the inequality of housing and infrastructure in poor places like Africa. And Luis, I believe you too have some slides. I can't oh, can do without. Well, maybe they'll come up. But I don't, whose is that? Oh, well. That's, that's yours? Grid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have them roll, and we're just going to start basically uh, the conversation so you can see some of these pictures and <clears throat> understand what we're going to be talking about. So, we've just talked about water. We've had all the other issues of technology, of artificial uh, intelligence, and of all the decisions. Can I start by asking, and I'm gonna start by asking you here, Mariana, because you're right next to me, the political and the cost of all of these good intentions. Because I think the one thing many, many people, no matter what political stripe they're from, agree with President Trump is the need to invest in infrastructure. In the United States, obviously, it's begging for it, and the rest of the world needs it. But it is really difficult to get politics on board to agree to mass infrastructure projects. Hmm. So, well, one striking thing for me as an economist is just how little we've heard about the economy. So if I can give like a 30 second background of the economic situation in which we're living, one of the reasons why the infrastructure uh, discussion is interesting is actually that many countries, at least in the West, have not been growing through investment-led growth, of which infrastructure is part of that. They've actually been growing through private debt, everyone talks about public debt, private debt consumption-led growth, and this is unsustainable, and it's what actually caused the financial crisis, and we are back to record levels of private debt over disposable income. People are incredibly indebted because real incomes have not been growing since the 1980s. Great, so now we talk about infrastructure, and the infrastructure issue is important because it's part of the investment-led growth discussion. The problem is that then it often gets interpreted in terms of kind of shovel-ready projects, you probably heard that word, or Keynes talked about digging ditches and filling them up again. And what we do know is that the multiplier effect, if we you know, forget inequality just for a minute, just the effect on the economy is lower if you're just kind of digging a hole and filling it up, whether it's with a bridge, a road, or whatever, than if you actually have sort of a plan around that infrastructure. So say Germany's energy vendor policy today, which is a plan for the country, it's a project, there's a vision, there's a mission. Infrastructure sort of fits within that vision of a green transformation of the whole economy. The net effect on the economy, also in terms of synergies between manufacturing and services and between sectors, and I love the emphasis I have heard quite a bit from different speakers that we want to talk cross-sectorally, we want to talk about problems, the water problem, you talked about all the different domains of that. That's where infrastructure becomes interesting. It's not digging a hole, it's solving a problem, and the problem is not just about climate change, so the green energy, sorry, the green transformation, it's also about care. Right, the care, the social care, the health care infrastructure. So the question is, do we actually have the capacity today, and I think Alejandro was talking about this quite a bit, to talk about these problems democratically and then the role that infrastructure plays within that, and the question of who pays for it, by the way, is hugely relevant. Finance is not neutral. We know this in sectors, so biotech got really screwed by the short-term financial sort of returns that they were after in three years that the VC industry was after. The same thing is with infrastructure. Who finances it then endogenously affects the characteristics of that infrastructure, including who has access to it. Let's jump from that massive uh, economic and financial hurdle over to the people who need it the most, uh, the poor. 
I mean, if we've seen nothing in the last few years of elect electoral backlash, it's those who feel dispossessed. And I guess nowhere more so these days than in parts of the places, in parts of the world where you're working, Jonathan, and the whole drone port idea. We did hear uh, a little bit earlier that, you know, drones are just for military purposes, but actually they have been for military. And now you, along with the Norman Foster, are trying to harness drones to bring what to Africa? Well, <clears throat> I think it's a larger discussion. I, I think uh, speaking especially to younger people in the audience, um, your future, uh, whether you like it or not, will uh, be affected, influenced, and determined by Africa, especially here in Spain. Uh, obviously, uh, we have migration issues already. Um, the ratio of uh, youth, 15 to 24 years old uh, youth, um, uh, is about 2.2 African youth to one uh, European youth, including Russian uh, kids today. Uh, by 2025, that shifts to four to one. So we are really at this colossal tipping point, demographic tipping point. So that's the first thing. So the population is, is really charging ahead. That's not going to change. Uh, Hank uh, did a great job hitting some of the questions about climate change and variability of our natural environment. Um, and then, you know, uh, from an infrastructure, from an economics point of view, Africa has $50 billion a year uh, public infrastructure spending gap to stand still. So they're, they're $50 billion away from standing still. And obviously, uh, China is investing very fast. The European Union has been pathetic. I mean, the quality of their projects are good, but the, the amount of money which is available is poor. Then, on the other point, uh, which uh, was raised earlier today, there's, no, there's never going to be an industrial base in Africa. There will be more industry, but it will never be even at the levels of industry which Africa had in the 1950s. So you have a future where you have a lot of young people with smartphones, uh, with not much to do, uh, pushed together. Uh, the only possible happy outcome is a more sharing economy where you are using new methodologies. I think Alejandro's presentation was, was amazing. So the drone port, um, uh, and thanks to Norman, uh, it was unbelievable privilege working with you on this. Um, the drone port is an idea of thinking about towns. We haven't talked about towns at all. So what happens to an average African town in 10 years' time? Which now it's at 20,000, it's going to be at 50,000. The only civic building in the town is a weird looking Catholic church. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, in the context of that town, can you build a civic building which is adding an extra layer of transportation? Uh, cargo drones or flying robots are, are only going to transport 5 or 6% of the goods in that town, but high value goods for healthcare, for agriculture, uh, for uh, consumer spending, uh, spare parts. Uh, so the idea is, uh, yeah, here we are. So the idea is uh, to build a building out of uh, natural materials, which is very labor intensive, uh, which uh, allows a kind of messy, I love this slide, this is a kind of messy ecosystem in the best sense of the word. So a non-Uber future uh, where uh, goods are, uh, and services are being shared by the local community. And there's this sort of meshing, I think this is the last point I made, uh, an extreme meshing between low technology mm -hmm. and super advanced technology. So this, this uh, bifurcation that we have between Niall and uh, Nicholas on, on the panel this morning is a red herring. It's an absolute red herring. You, you, you want to understand that uh, people are not going to have much money, but still there are forms of automation in robotics, also use of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which can apply in poorer communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a little bit about the drone port project, and uh, uh, it's yeah. just a start. You know? I mean, you know, to, to build whole towns cheaply and efficiently in some of these poor areas. But I want to go to you now, Jeanette. 
partly because of what you've done as transportation chief in New York under Mayor Bloomberg, partly because of the politics and the bureaucracy around trying to get anything done. Mm -hmm. For instance, regarding this drone port, I mean, Norman was quoted as saying that, uh, you know, the, the, the places like Britain and others are sort of lagging behind. Bureaucracy is really, really difficult. And you had to, you know, reclaim land in Hong Kong to build, I think it was the airport, and that was done pretty quickly. But in places like England, it's very, very, very difficult, and they're, you know, they're very far behind. What was the, for you, what was the biggest political hurdle or the bureaucratic hurdle of trying to get Times Square pedestrianized or the cycle lanes or the whole transportation revolution that you brought to the infrastructure of the city? Well, I think the critical issue is actually having a vision of where you want to go, right? You're not going to change the big ship of a city if you don't have a plan to get where you need to go. So having that plan, Mike Bloomberg did Plan YC, which was how are we going to accommodate the million more people that are expected to move to New York City by 2030 and still improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods and our business districts? And that had some pretty profound implications for how government worked, not only in transportation, but how we worked together across city agencies. And so that was really key. The other piece is, is that New Yorkers, probably like many of you here, were very skeptical that change could actually ever happen in their lifetime, right? New Yorkers thought, oh, a greater, greener New York City. You know, that's nice. That'll sit on the shelf. And so we moved very quickly to show what was possible on the streets of New York, working on a pilot basis, literally using paint to paint the city that we wanted to see. So we could literally outline a plaza. We could paint a protected bike lane. We could paint bus lanes. So we built 400 miles of bike lanes. We built seven rapid bus lines. We launched the largest bike share system in North America all in seven years. And I think what we showed, and this is really important, is that it doesn't need to cost a lot of money and it doesn't need to take a lot of time. But what's really important is that you look at your base asset differently. S streets are some of the most valuable re real estate that a city has. And so it's looking about it opportunistically, those possibilities that are hidden in plain sight. And so it's really encouraging to me to see that mayors around the world are taking that up. And when you think about it, mayors think really in four-year terms, right? And infrastructure projects usually don't even start to get done for five years, at least in New York. I don't know how it is here, but it takes five years. So if you can show politically an outline of where you want the city to go and people can see what's possible, that goes so much farther than anything else. And so at the beginning of the Bloomberg administration, you know, you'd ask a New Yorker what they thought about bikes and I really couldn't say it on the podium, what they actually thought. Um, you know, on. at any given time, there were like seven and a half million, eight, eight and a half million New Yorkers. There were actually eight and a half million traffic engineers because <laughs> everybody knew what they wanted to do with their streets. So people didn't like the bike lanes. They didn't like the buses. They didn't like the 60 pedestrian plazas. But by the end of the Bloomberg administration, at the last poll taken, and this came from moving quickly and showing what was possible, we had overwhelming support uh, over 64% support for bike lanes, bus lanes, and plazas. And so people are so far ahead of the press and the politicians when it comes to their streets and when it comes to improving the quality of life, the affordability, and the connectivity of their cities. People are the most important. I mean, this is all about people. You can have as many star architects and shiny buildings and great bridges and this and that, but if it doesn't deliver for the people, you have issues. For instance, it's said that, Luis, I want to address this to you. It was said earlier this morning that cities are the most democratic places for people to live. Um, but yet, it's not just the poor who can't live and go to work in a city like London. It's my colleagues, my team, who are the younger members of my team who can't afford to put down, you know, the deposit to buy a house, who can't afford to, you know, live anywhere near where they go to work, which is very different than the generation before them. So how can you make affordable housing, in other words, infrastructure, for our young people? We've heard about, for instance, Manhattan 
um, the river system prevented it from sprawling out and instead it went up and it was dense and it's, it's more efficient. We heard a little bit about England, London having this green belt, which similar, has a similar effect to sprawl. But there's a debate in Britain right now about whether some of this green belt stuff is just a load of wasteland and could be put to better use for housing that's affordable instead of these, you know, shiny ghettos that we find in our cities where people invest in and never turn a light on. What do you no, think? No, abs uh, absolutely. I think uh, cities have um, a hinterland that could be used sometimes. Uh, in the past, we decided that every city needed a, a green belt to protect it. And, uh, and indeed, cities need uh, green spaces, as we discussed before. But uh, density is crucial. Mm -hmm. When we discuss uh, infrastructures, um, if there is one single uh, um, message that I would like to send here, is that uh, to have affordable infrastructures, we need capacity, we need dense cities. And um, if cities are dense, you know, dense cities are more sustainable. In the end, uh, I sometimes say that uh, concrete is greener than grass. And, uh, and this is true everywhere. So a sprawl is a still a major enemy. We can build housing, affordable housing, increasing the density of cities. Sometimes using, you know, these pockets of opportunity in, in gray areas. Um, but as in the case of infrastructures, um, the, so the, the building of housing must be oriented towards one major political and social goal, which is make cities more balanced. Cities are great inventions, and uh, of course, uh, are, we are healthier and we are richer, and, uh, and, and, and we like living in cities because we like being together. But at the same time, they, they are um, sources of inequality. And uh, if this backlash against uh, globalization and technology is not to take place, or is going to be you know, reduced, uh, uh, we really need to balance the, the inequalities that are also present in the territory, in the space. So the whole thing about increasing inequality, I mean, obviously, humanity needs to be together. People like being together. They get their energy, their, their sustenance, their support from each other, from their neighbors. And I just picked, you know, a, a, a while ago, this out of the, the FT on a Saturday. For instance, there's some cities that do it well and some do it bad. Um, it praises uh, the community focus in Dutch cities um, for the way they've evolved with a focus on the public realm. So the infrastructure is about the public realm. Mm -hmm. Their use of public space is very interesting. Children play on the streets. People cycle instead of driving cars. We've talked about the cycling, but the children who can play, the neighbors who can talk to each other versus what doesn't work, and there's a little development in Chelsea Harbor in, uh, in England, which is basically a gated community, and it was designed to bring people and attract people but actually it doesn't. So how, what is it? Is it politics? Is it innovation? Is it spending well, coordinated spending that can get our cities back to being, and, and all living space, infrastructurally friendly for humanity? Hank. Ah, thank <laughs> you for this. It's off the water, That's, out yes, of your comfort the, zone no, there. No, this is all about water, of course. Because um, <laughs> this is the infrastructure panel and infrastructure starts with water, but it's how do you create uh, the, the, the inclusivity and the equality? And if you only think about Africa as one of the continents, and, and you talked about it as well, 70% lives in informal settlements, and there is no infrastructure. There is no tap to turn on with water out, coming out of it. So it's the poor that actually pay five to five ta five, 50 times as much for the same amount of water than the rich. Mm -hmm. And then the water is not guaranteed, so 5,000 people die every day because of that water. But the moment you bring water in, so you create infrastructure, a common good, and therefore also a common practice and the capacity to deal with it, the moment you bring it in, it's of course women that step up, they're far more entrepreneurial than men, they lead this community to progress, and when you build a toilet in the school, it's actually the, the, the girls that can stay in school and don't have to skip, so education mm -hmm. evolves. Mm -hmm. So it's infrastructure at the heart, and infrastructure is also water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That is good. But now our water infrastructure in our city is leaking, 40% often, leakages uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, problems in our city. Yeah. Second, 
the common, as you mentioned, in the Dutch cities, of, of course, goes way back to how we think that the common actually brings good. Uh, it also builds to uh, 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 Mariana and uh, Jeanette's point. You need a plan that is comprehensive. At the same time, you have to start now. And that type of a common way of doing it, of being, bringing everyone together, is critical. So it has to be transparent and inclusive. You have to make mistakes fast to learn, to pilot. It doesn't have to cost much. But I do stick with the question I can't solve. I'm not an economist. And I totally agree with Mariana's starting point with the plan and yours. But the business case is often so tough when it comes to long-term, comprehensive, how can, you, how can we start to convince the investors, small and big, public and private, individual and institutional, to understand that this is the way forward, that this inclusive, comprehensive way is actually adding to the economy? I'm going to go to Jeanette and Mariana right now. First, Mariana, the issue of the taxation, who pays for this, but also infrastructure affects politics. Yeah. Brexit, for instance. Yes, there was a lot about the immigration and this and that, but people talked about the pressure on their infrastructure, on their education, on their hospitals, on their, you know, all of those, transportation, etc. I mean, it has, if you don't get it right, it has the capacity to upend, upend the world. Right. Well, that would be a whole other conversation because, of course, when we go to war, we don't say, oh, there's no money. We just right. go to war, right. right? So this was also the point raised before that when there's a security concern. So if we start actually calling this a war, which perhaps we should, you know, there used to be a war on poverty. That word was actually used. Uh, there's a war on the climate. Uh, there's a war in many ways on health seen much more broadly in terms of care. But I think what's interesting is if you also think of this in terms of contracts, right, infrastructure in some way, is also about a contract. You use the word con the common good. Right. Unfortunately, in economics, we don't really use that very much. We talk about it in philosophy. In economics, right. we have this notion of the public good. But it's actually been used to reduce the sort of ambition of what we could be doing in terms of this kind of vision. Okay. And if you think of what's happening in space, and I recently did a project for NASA and ESA on what's happening in the economy up there, which is low Earth orbit. It's all of a sudden getting populated by different private sector companies, whether it's Elon Musk or Virgin um, Galactic, which keeps kind of making mistakes. But anyway, um, the contracts are so problematic. So you have Novartis, a very, very rich pharmaceutical company that definitely has some cash in hand, working for free on a public infrastructure in space called the International Space Station. And it's very unclear why that was allowed, why they're even allowed to be patenting up there. This is a public infrastructure with publicly paid, taxpayer paid astronauts up there doing experiments for Novartis for free, and then they are also able to privatize that, that innovation up there. I mean, there really is a very problematic, skewed power relationship right now, both on Earth and unfortunately in space. And let me just ask people, this is gonna be my little audience intervention, someone yell out what you think the top marginal taxation rate, right, with the richest of the rich, the top marginal rate paid when NASA was founded. I'll give you a hint. Um, well, I won't give you a hint. Anyway, the president at the time was Eisenhower, a Republican military general. Okay, what was the percentage, just yell out a number, that the richest paid of their income? Yeah, you guys were smart. I thought you were just a bunch of artists. Yeah. No, you cannot. Yeah, yeah, okay. What was it? I didn't hear it. Uh, 91. Okay. okay. Right. A lot of tax. No, what's actually happened to tax is very interesting. In the name of innovation, some of the most regressive taxation policies have happened. So this short-termism, this problem of short-term finance, has very much actually been lobbied in some ways through different types of sort of, you know, I mean, it was actually the National Venture Capital Association that lobbied for the capital gains tax to fall by 50% in five years. But this question of short-termism, it doesn't yeah. have to be that way. And the reason that China is building the UK infrastructure today is because finance in the UK is very short-term. And unfortunately, companies have become very short-term. They've become ultra-financialized. Apple, under Steve Jobs, was not financialized. Steve Jobs reinvested the profits back into R&D, design, et cetera. Tim Cook's vision of Apple is a 150 billion share buyback scheme. Does corporate governance matter? You know, that would be a question yeah. to ask Johnny Ive. Yeah. Luis, I want you to refer to your slides. 
and they, hopefully they'll come up in a second. But, you know, Spain spent a lot of money on infrastructure. We've got the beautiful airports, we've got lots and lots of things. Was that the right thing to do? Well, of course, some of the infrastructures which were built were unnecessary, and they have been source of great um, social and public debate, but most of them were useful. So on the whole, it's been, I think, a great uh, 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 social and, and, and uh, communitarian effort. Um, as we are in Madrid, let me remind you, 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 you before asked, uh, what do we need for infrastructures? Uh, uh, finance, uh, technology, design? There's one more important factor, political leadership. Mm. Now we were told about Medellin, political leadership. In Madrid, the more significant new infrastructure is Madrid-Rio, our big dig, mm -hmm. you know, putting uh, underground the ring road and creating a linear park which is six kilometers long and which is hugely successful with the communities, with the barrios. In this case, you know, which was promoted through the, pol the political leadership of a former mayor, I think uh, you, you find sort of the both uh, qualities that you need for the cities to be successful. On the one hand, the river was surrounded by very densely built uh, urban tissue. So they, they had a new park close to their homes. And secondly, it was not the richest part of Madrid. So it contributed to balance the city socially and, and economically. So it was both density and, uh, as I said before, um, social balance could be carried out with political leadership, which is, in the end, a key factor. Mm -hmm. um, we have to wrap up in two minutes. I'm going to give Jeanette and Jonathan the last word because everybody else had their second round. If you could just give me a minute on what you might want to, what you haven't said that you'd like to say about the infra infrastructure challenge. Yeah, well, I guess quickly, and I'll speak like a New Yorker, mm -hmm. um, people and companies can move anywhere in this day and age. And so the quality of life that you have in your city is, is critical. And so bike lanes, bus lanes, pedestrian plazas, the kind of basic infrastructure that cities can deliver are, are not just nice things to have, they're actually an economic development strategy. And in an era where the federal government's running away from spending infrastructure dollars, states are running away from spending infrastructure dollars, mayors and cities are the future, mayors are in a unique position to actually address the infrastructure problem today and they're already doing that and they're the ones that are coming up with new ways to finance public uh, infrastructure, whether it's bringing in the private sector in to do transit-oriented development and building the first subway line in many, many years with the seven line, whether it's our bike share program subsidized by Citibank, sponsored by Citibank, whatever it is. And the other thing that I think is really exciting for the world is that mayors are becoming competitive about who's more green, right? Because they get how important that is. And I think that's a great uh, competition to have, and I think it, it speaks volumes about um, the opportunities to build a greater, greener planet. And I want Jonathan to end on one minute. I mean, it's, it's only a minute, but it's a big, it's a big departure. <clears throat> Infrastructure, we do-gooders, pour trillions of dollars into Iraq, Afghanistan, maybe Syria one day to build infrastructure, which then doesn't get built, which then isn't sustainable, which then goes to rubble and nobody ever gets to use it. What is the challenge as you see that there? In one minute. Well, um, we, we know each other from the past when I was a war correspondent with you and um, you know, I got into this space because I can see that we will have major conflict. We certainly will have pan-African terrorism threats, which will make ISIS look very small, um, unless we engage uh, with a, a whole new level of imagination. Um, so I think we kind of need a, a neo-Victorian ambition um, to really uh, engage uh, with an infrastructure which has not yet been built. That's the cool thing. That's a really exciting opportunity. Uh, the, the bit of the planet which we're talking about, where the future of our species is going to be determined, is the equatorial belt of the planet. They don't have an infrastructure yet. They can have a 21st century infrastructure, and that's a pretty exciting prospect. And I hope right. some of the young students here will get on the plane uh, south of the equator and uh, do it. That's a good call to arms to wrap up, particularly for all the young people here. Louise, Jonathan, Jeanette, Hank, and Mariana, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>